to make sure that families know that life needs to be celebrated. Welcome. We are sitting together, Jack Longley and myself, a longtime friend, to guide grief and to have a discussion about helping families and assisting them through difficult times. Jack is a longtime minister and supported a uh, faith community for over 31 years. Jack, thank you for being here. Actually, 60 years. 60. Yeah, <laughs> but I'm 31 years old. 31. <laughs> Uh, when did you know you were equipped to guide and listen to those that are grieving? I don't know if you ever know. I don't know if, if, if it comes to you through great revelation or not. I think it comes as part of your uh, position. I know the first, first service that I ever officiated at was a young boy who had been in my college group and uh, he died of an accident and the parents called me and they said, we need you. So you don't necessarily go to books at that time and see what am I supposed to do. You just go and meet with the family and start going from there. You listen to the needs, what do they want. Of course, I knew the young boy, so that was very helpful to me. And uh, then I got to spend time with the family. Uh, and then they were asking me if I had officiated at the service. So meeting a family where they're at as opposed to a preconceived notion, that's a pretty developed perspective yeah. for for service to, yeah. to go in yeah. and say uh, how can I help this family based on what they need versus what you think they need I read books on funerals I read books on um, you know memorial services and graveside services but I don't think you really can go by the book I think that each service is, is different each service each each person that has that has passed away uh, they had different needs, different desires. Some were religious, some were not religious. Um, some were not religious, but they had a religious family. And so you have to sit down with the family and work with them, and you just can't go say, well, on page 39 of this book, this is what you're supposed to do. Right, Here, here's here's this guide, yeah. Yeah. here's this book, here's yeah. this, uh, this method that says, this is how you'll get through it. To me, the most important thing is for the family to know that you care, that you're there for them, that you're there to listen to them, you want to meet their needs and you want to meet whatever wishes that the deceased had and just being there. And then orchestrating a story. That's right. right. If, there's a, if they're not orchestrating the story, but how to tell the story to a congregation of individuals or a gathering of individuals. One of the first things I do when I sit down with this family is say, tell me about Nicholas. What was he like? What did he like? What were his hobbies? Yeah. What organizations did he belong to? How active was he in his church? We talk about about his family, and then I ask family members, "Why don't you tell me about Nicholas? What do you remember about Nicholas? What do you remember?" And by that, you begin to put together a story. So when you have a group of individuals in the room, they're able to connect because we know whenever whenever we meet at a chapel to celebrate someone's life. Mm -hmm. Everyone's coming from somewhere different. Mm -hmm. They're coming from potentially their own grief path, um, their own relationship mm -hmm. to that deceased. And is one of your goals to try to connect in some way, shape, or form to everyone, uh, or some more than others when you're presiding over the services? You're trying to communicate to the audience, to the grieving, but most especially, you're I am communicating to the family uh, because they're the ones that are really grieving. The others are, are there, they're grieving, and you try to give them something that they can hold on to that gives them hope. But the family, they're the ones that share. The interesting thing is though, whenever I meet with family, so often the family knows so little about the deceased. Where did he go to school? I don't remember. Was he part of any organization? And they start thinking, and they talk back and forth, and one would say, oh, he was a member of this. No, 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 he wasn't a member of that. And, and uh, you know, it's important that the family really knows something about the person that passed away, you know. Sometimes those conversations open it up, and then they realize maybe how much they do or don't know, and then how much they want to know. Yeah. Because that, you can open an entire chapter of someone's life. Yeah. Hey, we need to look back, we need to find out about this. Well, I have actually taught classes on how do you prepare for the inevitable. 
And I think um, I think it's very important. Everyone, is, I've told you, the death rate is 100%. Right. You know, none of us are going to escape it. And, uh, you know, it, um, you've experienced it in your family. I've experienced it in the loss of my wife, my parents. And uh, so it's going to happen. So I think we need to be prepared for it, prepare somehow for it, and prepare our family for it. Right. Allowing someone... Uh, to just have to make those plans without saying, hey, this is what I'd, mm -hmm. I'd like to have mm -hmm. done. Mm -hmm. um, so you can give them a guide right. to how to celebrate life. Um, you've been, you mentioned Irma, you're recently on um, the other side. Irma passed on March 18th mm -hmm. of 2018. How has that changed your perspective of the information that you've been sharing uh, and supporting families with for so many years? enormously. I used to be on that side of the desk and now I'm on this side of the desk. I used to be the one that was counseling the people and now I needed you and other people who would be counseling me. Um, and you find out a lot. Um, people who were very close friends, they can't handle it and they kind of disappear. And then there's other people that all of a sudden come out that you're just really kind of surprised that reach out to you. and. Um, so, you know, I had to learn to balance. There are times I wanted to be with people, times that I wanted to be alone, and uh, I just had to deal with my own grief. Uh, personally, I'm a person of great faith, and I live with the hope that I'm going to see my wife again someday. So that motivates me, keeps me going. And so when I'm having some, some difficult days, that's what I think about. Also, um, she died very quickly, and I get, I'm thankful for that that, you know, it was not a long period of suffering. Um, I mean, it was instantaneous that she was gone, but that was a tremendous shock. Right, it took the wind out of the sails. Yeah. And it can have all the conversations in the world, but you find yourself immediately in a, a stage of grief because uh, it was an unexpected. Sure, and as you know, she had a very large, there was a very large memorial service, mm -hmm. well over 300 people ever present. and. The reception lasted forever, and I remember I was standing forever in line and uh, greeting people. And many people just don't know what to say. And uh, people have asked me, what do you say? And I said, a hug. Just a hug. Or just say, I care. I'm here. Right. Call me. You know. Sometimes we get saturated with yep. the other side, yep. with, the, with uh, maybe thoughts and prayers and and someone's in a better place, yeah. and, you know, a better place would be right here with me yes. today. Yes. Um, uh, how do you counsel a family that's heard something that is uh, continuing to grade on them, uh, you know, from this side and the previous side, and someone said something that's silly or foolish, how do you guide them to focus on their loved one and not um, someone's well-meaning. I try to tell the family, people, it's awkward for people, they don't know what to say. Many people don't know what to Even I find myself, you know, I've, I've done funerals for 50, 55 years, and many times I don't know exactly what to say, just to say, I'm here for you. You know, I'm here for I care. Um, I think some of the worst thing is, I know what you're going through, you don't know what I'm going through. Right. Um, you know, I was married for 59 years, you know, and all of a sudden I come home to an empty house. I've gone to church with my wife in the morning, come home and I'm alone. And uh, so I still come home to that empty house. So there's, there's different feelings <clears throat> than the person that has had somebody that suffered a long time too. So uh, people don't know what to say. Oh, you're going to get over this. You're going to get over this. That's right. You're, you're, this this will this'll pass. You That's don't a, get over it. You don't get over it. You know. You, you, you lost a brother four or five years ago, you know. You, you, the pain is not as, as, as hurtful as it was the day that he died, but it's still there. Right. You still miss right. your brother. And I hope that I always miss my wife, you know, because she was such an integral part of my life. It's almost a reminder that we need to let people know that that continued feeling of loss and hurt, yeah. that, that part yeah. that's missing, that's that means that they're still with us. Yeah. And it is, it's not yeah. necessarily the whole, we don't have to fill it with anything else, but just knowing that mm -hmm. it's there, that it yeah. exists, and we can continue to celebrate that person. My wife was an artist, as you know, 
and I have all of her paintings, or many of her paintings in the living room and others in the den, and you know, I look at that and say, that's her. That's her, that's what she did. That was, that's, that was her focus, and I feel her presence even as I look at them. You know, I knew nothing about art. I can't even draw a barn and make it look like a barn. And <laughs> even if I do stick figures, yeah. they don't come out right. Uh, but you, she shared her gift, and that yeah. you get to experience. Yeah. It's so important that if we have a gift in this in this life, that we share it, uh, because it can. Uh, it's helping you now. Sure. Uh, but it helped other people to see beauty through her eyes. I used to tell her. I said, ten years from now, not many people remember any sermons I preached, but a lot of people have some of your paintings still in their home. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what do they say? That um, there's a, an old saying, uh, proverb. The things you do for yourself are gone when you are gone, but the things you do for others That's right. will remain as your legacy. That's right. um, so it is, it's that continued giving and uh, sure. sharing of our gift. Sure. What have been some of the hardest stages thus far um, that you've experienced? The hardest was the, was the total shock. I mean, you know, uh, like I said a few moments ago, uh, we drove to church together. We talked about who we were going to have brunch with, and when the time for brunch came, she was gone. And so I had to drive home from church after all was taken care of alone. And I kept thinking I'd hear the door to her studio open. I'd hear noises that I was sure was going to be her. Um, and it was just a total shock, a sense of terrible loneliness. Um, I had people there that came, people brought food, people were loving. My daughter stayed with me, my sister came from afar. And, you know, that was helpful, but it was just, I was in total shock. I was in total shock. It was totally unexpected. And then I went through various stages, you know, that, that you've heard about this. You know, there was, there was a period of anger, um, tremendous loneliness. I still feel the loneliness. You know, I still say goodnight to her every night. And uh, sometimes I talk to her at the table. But she never talks back anymore. <laughs> and I take her a rose every week. And, and I talk to her. and. Uh, you know, she's still very much alive, but the, uh, the hardest part was was the total shock. And I think I've worked. I think I've worked through most of those steps that they give you, but um, I'm still in shock a little bit. I'll see a picture of her, and I'll think, "Oh, that was just." You know, um, I had house cleaners come and for the first time in our lives, that house cleaner, cleaners come and clean the house, and one time they cleaned some the, the shower, and it was sparkling. Up. Oh, I got a show. I realized she wasn't there to show her. You know. uh, how would you guide um, being a widower now? A community that you would still that you still serve uh, about how to reach out to that individual and make sure that they're supported. We have a uh, societal norms which I, I think oh sometimes are wrong, and in this case they are that you know Jack's okay um, because he's a stoic and strong man but he needs so much assistance, uh, or he needs support. Maybe not assistance, but support. How, how would you guide a uh, community knowing what you know now? In my position, um, I have many friends. And um, um, I think sometimes people assume that things are all being taken care of. Um, it was good for me because the church that I, I'm part of brought meals. Uh, people came and visited, people came, uh, the, the pastor of the church I attend, um, now that I'm semi-retired, would come and visit me. Um, another thing that happens though for a man is you start getting casseroles. <laughs> because there's there's women who see there's a single man, you know, and uh, uh, you know, you have to be on your guard on that. Yeah. Uh, but how would I... You know, I watched my mother when she mourned the loss of my father, and uh, I think her grief was different than mine in many ways, though they were married for 67 years. And, um, uh, you know, she just felt so very much alone. I think people assume a man can, they, they, they can handle things, they, they, can, for they can take charge, and they don't realize um, there's a there's a book uh, entitled uh, "Real Men Cry Too," and I think uh, uh, I've I've called friends and said, "Do you have an extra bucket?" And they want to know why, and I said, "Well, I brought a fill mine with my tears. I needed a bucket," and um, th that you know, th 
men grieve as much, if not more, as women. The thing is, we tend to hold it in. And the man that holds it, I've told this to men, you know, you hold it in and you're going to have ulcers. You're going to get sick from, from holding it in. You let your feelings out. Find somebody you have confidence in, whether it's a grief counselor, a psychologist, a friend, somebody that you can just let it all out and say, this is what I'm feeling. Uh, I'm hurting today. Um, and know that they care enough. Or I just need a hug today. You know? <laughs> yeah, it, it's incredible how much we need connection. Yes. Um, and I think educating individuals that we need to reach out and don't assume somebody else yes. is doing it. Yes. Um, what have been some of the most impactful uh, communications that you've had uh, after the loss of Irma that you um, that you could share with others that if someone said, hey, what should I do? Mm -hmm. That you would say, this is this is what I'd recommend and you can continue to share in your pastoral life. What's been helpful to me is um, I've done a number of services now since um, in the last 10 months and to be able to sit down with the family and say I know what you're going through before I knew I, I knew from their experience but now I know it from my own experience what you're going through I know the pain that you're experiencing uh, I know the sense of loss that you're feeling I know that emptiness that you're feeling so in many ways I think it's helped me to be more sensitive to others um, and it's helped me in many other ways a lot of people have um, you know, it just been there for me, and I want people to know that I'm there for them. Uh, as far as the, the methodology, the approach, and you know, so many people are familiar with you know, the five stages of grief, and Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, and denial, and anger, and depression, and bargaining, and acceptance. Um, how do you look at that model, and have experienced it yourself, have guided, knowing those benchmarks, mm. and is that it? Is, is that all we need to know? Or I think there's more than five steps. Uh, I think those are those are good. Uh, for instance, I've added shock. And I think, um, to me, at the very end, the very last step, I think, is celebration. I think um, uh, Henry Nouwen, a Catholic theologian, wrote, um, we need to move from the morning to dancing. And he likens it to uh, somebody that's on a trapeze. And as they're going back and forth on the trapeze, they have to get to the point where they can let loose and trust the person that's on the other side. So as they're going, they reach out and they go and they let go. And that's part of the dancing and letting go and saying, you're entrusting that person to God or just entrusting that person to whatever you believe at that point. And um, you, you celebrate. You know, today I've learned to celebrate my wife's life. You know, I really do. Uh, I, I try to think of things that were, were, were pleasant rather than to think of that day when this all happened. Uh, the minute I start thinking of the events on March 18th of last year, I get really grief stricken. But when I think about what we did, uh, you know, anniversary celebrations that we had and, and trips that we took and conversations that we had. And my wife had a great, great giggle. Every, it was a couple of friends who said, said the thing that, thing that they missed most about her is her giggle. She had one that would just kind of start and then all of a sudden she just let go. And, you know, I miss that. Um, somebody asked her one time, what's the success of your marriage? And said, she said, we laugh a lot. You know, we take each other seriously, but sometimes you take each other too seriously. And so we laughed a lot. Um, I remember the night before she died, something happened and, and we both just ended up laughing, just, you know, like crazy. And uh, so I try, try to move to celebration. Um, I've gone through stages where I felt guilt. Um, where I wished I would have done something more, or wish I could have been there more, or wish this would have happened. I went through the anger, uh, uh, anger, anger at, at a doctor. I was anger at God. I walk, and I think I'll go that way today. You know, um, you, you, there were just feelings that you feel of guilt. I wish, you know, um, I wish I could have told her goodbye. Um, but I tell her goodbye each day, you know, and I, at the same time I say good morning to her every morning and good night to her every night. So I try to tell people that bring up the positive things, bring up the happy times, bring up the times that you laughed and uh, the, the joys, you know. Give you a quick illustration. When my wife gave birth to our first child, 
I kissed the wrong woman when they brought her out of the delivery room. <laughs> and my wife, to her dying day, never quite forgave me of that, but she always <laughs> giggled about it, you know. <laughs> they, they rolled this woman out, and, and uh, she looked just like my wife. She was face down, and I kissed her and told her she had a little girl, and found out later the woman had a boy. And <laughs> <laughs> oh, I hope they're doing well. <laughs> How do you take your life experience um, and all your years in ministry and the loss of Irma when you're in an arrangement room or you've come to a family's house and they're telling their story and you're helping to shape that service. Mm -hmm. um, what are the, uh, what are you searching for beyond you know, anecdotes and um, information so that we can support their grief? Tell me about the person. Introduce me to the person. Maybe so many. Sometimes I don't know the person. If I know the person well, then that's much easier. But sometimes I'm called upon to do a service where I have not met the person. So introduce me to this person. Tell me what their likes were, and um, then ask them, "What do you want for a service?" And I have an outline that I take, and I, I kind of say, "This is what I have. That could be some suggestions." But let's, let's talk about, and let me put it together, and then let's talk about it further, see what you want and what you don't want. Um, you know, I say we usually begin this way, we go here, and we use some scripture here, and, and then we'll do a eulogy. Uh, do you want some music? What, what type of music do you want? Um, some people want to make sure they have all hymns, and then they can't think of any hymns. Uh, and some people don't want any hymns. Um, um, you know, and so you, you try to do a, a good balance, uh, and I let them know, even though I'm a pastor, it doesn't have to be all religious. You know, you could uh, you could have something that's that's lighter that make people kind of remember the positive things. Yeah. Illust illustration. Yeah. My dad's favorite song was "I'm a Ding Dong Danny from Dumas." You ought to see me strut my stuff. <laughs> and he wanted that played at his funeral. And I said, Dad, I said, Dad, you can't play that at your funeral. Well, it was in a Presbyterian church in Kentucky, and I said, my father's favorite song was, and they hit it, Phil Harris singing, I'm a Ding Dong Daddy from Dumas, and everybody sat up, <laughs> and they went home and said, oh my God, did you hear what song that they sang? You know, the, you know, at the same time, he wanted some hymns. You know, he wanted a friend to sing, How Great Thou Art. But, you know, you, 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 you can do something light. I, I think it's, it's great in a service when somebody tells a story that makes everybody laugh. You know, there's, there's enough grief going on, and the people are experiencing the loss, so let's, let's have a good balance. And I really want to know from the family what this person meant to them individually. You know, what, uh, what did your brother mean to you? What did your father mean to you? What did, you know, tell, tell me, and tell me some of the things that he did or she did that really stand out in your mind. And then we incorporate those as best we can in the service. Some people want to get in and get out. You know, can you do a 15-minute service? Well, yeah, but you're not going to have it as personal as if you're going to be able to go. If off. you're guiding through a service and you're having those conversations and the family is saying, hey, you know, we absolutely don't want there to be any faith in it. How often does that actually happen? Because I feel a lot of the times it's brought up that there's still things that are wanted or requested. But um, how do you guide a family in, in those circumstances? I tell them sometimes that maybe I'm not the right person to do the service. You know, uh, I want to help them, but I, I don't feel my calling, that I feel is a calling that I have from God, my calling is to bring hope and faith to a family. And if they don't want any faith, I don't know how I can bring them hope. Your world has been doing that through faith for all yes. for for a great many years. That's right. That's right. That's right. And um, you know, I've had families who I remember they told me that I remember one particular was a, a gentleman that had died. I met with the family at home, and the wife and the daughter both said he didn't have faith, but we did, and we want faith incorporated in the service, even though he said he did not want it. And we, I tried to be sensitive to his wishes. He had some poems. That he wanted that were that we might say were secular style poems. Uh, at the same, we included those. Uh, we included songs that he liked, uh, but at the same time, I gave some hope and faith that the family wanted me to share.
how do you maintain contact? Is it how much uh, of, of the onus is on to a minister that's had a relationship and created a relationship, mm -hmm. be it through church or through just meeting for services? And what part of that is on a family uh, or those that are there that are seeking support? Okay, if if it's a part of if if it's an individual who's part of the church. It's much easier to keep contact. You you see them. You you hopefully they're in worship services. You see them in any activities at the church, and and that happens. If they are not part of the church, if if for instance I've been called and you say um, this family would like to have a clergyman, they're from out of town or they have not been active in a church, would you do it? Uh, I always let them know my services to you do not end at the burial or at the at the at the at the funeral home. I'm available to you, and I give them my card, and I want them to feel free to call me. Um, I would, I'd say 30-40% do call me and sometimes I call them if, if, it's, if I know the situation. Um, I, some years ago I did one where a man went to teach his class in school and fell over dead in front of his students and it was a total shock to the family. They just had a big celebration and I, I met with them and it was like what I went through, this terrible shock. Sorry. And I went back and visited them in their home several times. The wife called me on the phone several times. I met with one of the sons uh, because they were so grief-stricken. And um, to me, that's part of my ministry. That's part of, you know, um, you can get just about anybody to come in and just do a service and do it by the book. But I feel part of my responsibility is, is a ministry to these people. If do you differentiate how you guide a family, whether you're um, in the chapel or you're in the church or you're at the graveside service? And are, are there different things you'll do um, or share to communicate with them uh, on those different occasions, sometimes all in one day? You mean if you do all three of those services? Yeah, if, if you're going to be at a church, is, is what you communicate different than it might be at the graveside uh, um, or at the final resting place? Well, at the graveside, it's very brief. Um, an in, in interment service is probably all of five to seven minutes, you know. Uh, many times people have chosen now to have a graveside service where you go 15, 20 minutes where you, it, it's, it's, it's different, but you, I also, 90% of the time will include scripture. Uh, I will do, uh, many times a graveside service, they'll say it's just family. So you don't need to do a history, tell them uh, when they were born, when they did this and that right. and the other. Uh, so, uh, but if, it, if it's a church service, obviously there'll probably be members of the congregation that don't know, so you include things like that. Uh, the music would probably be a little different than the music that you might do if you were even, even in the memorial chapel here. Um, I've actually done services at grave, grave sites where really they brought a boombox and they wanted to play a song, you know. So um, I think, to me, as a, as a clergyman, you have to be flexible where, where you are. I mean, um, and I try to explain to the family the various types of services that are available to them. One of the things you, you mentioned, and um, um, We've talked about it, and it, the the song again that your dad's favorite song. I'm a ding dong daddy from Duba. She ought to see me strut my stuff. <laughs> uh, if you had, um, he also liked. I'd be glad when you're dead, you rascal, you. And I said, Dad, we're not going <laughs> to do not that. Doing that one. <laughs> uh, have you made the decision for yourself whether it's burial or cremation? Yep, yep. And my wife had. I taught this class at the Presbyterian Church in Los Gatos, and. Um, it was a, a class called Preparing for the Inevitable. Uh, you were one of our speakers. We had, a, had an attorney. We had somebody from hospice. We had another pastor. Um, we had a, 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 a counselor. And we tried to deal with I told everybody there that they should uh, write their own obituary. Mm -hmm. I, <clears throat> I think that's so important. I'm amazed at the people I call on that don't know a lot of a person's story. I've even had spouses couldn't remember where they were married. You know, I, they, I, I assume they were married, but they could not remember where, whether it was a church or, well, it was this church up on the hill somewhere, um, or they couldn't remember the, the school, so forth. So I ask everybody to, to uh, write their own obituary, and secondly, that they prepare their memorial service. My memorial service, uh, I have it on, on, on my computer, 
and I've also sent it to the pastor of the church. So if and when I die, not when, but I mean if when, <laughs> uh, he he can he can pull it up. Again, right? And the pastor told those that attended this class, or some forty some people, he was going to prepare folders uh, that would be available so that. Uh, Nicholas Welsenbach would have, he passes away and he pulls that folder out and here's Nicholas Wishes right there. Um, so uh, you do your, 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 that and then you make a list. Um, for instance, I had quadruple heart by, bypass surgery a year and a half ago. You look great. And I wrote my wife a list of 15 things if I should die and uh, told her who to call uh, and it was about 15 people there. Ironically, I used the list when she died, but um, uh, I, I've had people call me. I remember particularly a, a, a wife of one of my members passed away and he called me four o'clock in the morning from the hospital and says, what do I do? And I said, well, do you have a mortuary? No. Who do I call? And so I said, I'll come to the hospital. No, no, don't come to the hospital. Just, just tell me. And so I worked through, told him several options that he had. Um, and 20 minutes later, he called again and want to know something else. Um, it, it's amazing to me how, how many people have not made these preparations. You know, I'm 82 years old, I know I'm not gonna live forever. And, and, and uh, but like I've told you, I've done funerals of children. You know, I've done, I've done funerals of very young people. Um, Steve, the young man I told you about was 19 years old. Yeah. So, um, you, I, I think it's important that, that People have these preparations, and the family knows where they are, that they have all their things taken care of with their attorneys. Uh, another thing that I do, and I've done my, uh, that I encourage, is write a letter to each member of your family and attach it to your will, and write, at, upon my death, you can read this. So I've written each of my children. I want to now write my grandchildren, and it's, it's attached, so when they die, I've told them my heart and how I felt about them. Oh, that's wonderful. You know, like a journaling or writing letters, but so you have you've made your decision for burial or cremation. Yep. Um, obviously, service or no service, you would plan to have. Uh, I want you to sing at my service. I will be. I'll do the singing. I, I do hymns. <laughs> uh, yes, I have. I made you know, and um, that's what made it very easy when Irma died. Um, um, immediately, uh, she did, had decided where she wanted to be buried and she knew that she wanted to be cremated. And so I didn't have to, you know, I've, I've sat with families, they really, well, what do you, what do you recommend? I'm sure you have that, you know, sure. you know what do you recommend? Um, and so I tell them I can't recommend. Uh, you, you have to make the choice, because the last thing I'm gonna do is, oh, you should have the person cremated, and then after they're cremated, they go, oh, I wish I could have, have no, this is where their body is buried, you know. And so uh, you, you give them the options. And uh, yeah, it was very, you know, you were part of it. It was, uh, it was very easy for me when my wife passed away. As it relates to having everything put together. If yeah, you... and, and, I, and I think everybody should do this. Um, I, you know, I think we had to somehow regularly have classes or seminars or whatever it is for people and of all faiths, mm -hmm. of all faiths, right? because we're, we're all going to die. No one's immune mm -hmm. to it. How, how about for you, if you were um, on your list, music that you've selected? Songs I've selected? So, sing, things for your funeral home, for, our, for your funeral. What would you... Um... Oh, you're making me remember when I put it down. Uh, I, want, uh, I chose songs that I felt were personal and songs of faith. Uh, like for instance, my wife, she loved the song uh, Just a Closer Walk With Thee, so we made sure. And she'd ask me if I'd play the piano at her funeral. Uh, and I said to her, well, that will, you know, that'll never happen because you're gonna die, or I'm gonna die before you. Uh, but I, I went into the church and I remember that's what she wanted and I told the, the pastor, I said, uh, by the way, I'm gonna play the piano when we sing that. Um, but uh, songs of praise to God, my faith, how great thou art, is I think the opening hymn. Um, and the last hymn is for all the saints that they that have sung in, and a couple very personal, you know, about, about heaven in there. Um, if you could have anyone preside over your service, who would that be and why? 
Dave Waterholder at the Presbyterian Church of Los Gatos. Um, one, he's a personal friend. Two, I've seen him in action. Three, he was there when I needed him. And I know my family trusts him. And um, I just know he would do well. His assistant, uh, Erica Rader, is also good. And I would enjoy it if she was part of it as well. Yeah. Actually, I, I have listed on my service who I want. I've included, I've served churches of, of different nations. I've served, I've served in, a, in, uh, in a German English church. I've served in an Indonesian church. I've served in a Korean church. And presently, I'm serving in a Taiwanese church. And so I've included some of these pastors to do scriptures and be part that's of that service. So, you know, that's it. Where, what are you up to now? Where can uh, listeners find you? What, what are you up to uh, as far as uh, community outreach and being involved in um, the greater Silicon Valley community, Los Gatos? I spend a lot of time counseling. I have a lot of people come to my home and for, for counseling. Uh, counseling with, uh, from spiritual issues to alcohol issues to marital problems, you name it. And I, I spend a lot of time, um, I'm looking forward to some opportunities that are, have been offered to me to become more involved in uh, some outreach throughout the community. But I'm doing one step at a time. I'm still presently serving. I went to this Taiwanese church for three months, and that was in October of 2016, and I'm right. still there. <laughs> uh, and the time is supposed to end March of this year, so we'll see. And then some endeavor in the future. If, if uh, listeners wanted to reach out to you in any way, um, via email or social media, is there a, a way that someone can reach you? Uh, they'll find me on Facebook. And my email, you want to know that? Mm -hmm. uh, it's just my name, Jack Longley at rocketmail.com. All right. Jack, thank you for um, sharing personal uh, information as it relates to the loss of your late and great wife, Irma. Mm -hmm. um, I am grateful to have you as a friend and on our show today. And uh, I wish you the best in all the things that are to come and hope I get to be involved and stay in touch. I just want to say thank you to you too and I think the people from uh, Darling Fisher have been just, you know, I've referred people but this time I experienced it and the people from the moment that she passed away to the service, uh, I know one of your directors said he ended up having to go out and even direct traffic because there were so many people that were coming. And I really appreciated that. You've been very, it was, it was more than just a client to, that's walked in and we do a service. You, you, were, you were there when I needed you. Thank you. You're most welcome. Thank you, Jack. We need to make sure that families know that life needs to be celebrated.